uh, in Grenoble. It was a crawl in, uh, uh, in, in France. Uh, so this is another experience that, uh, you know, it was really uh, uh, amazing. Uh, later on, so I, talk to, uh, I told you about global sub product support, which is a GPS, a team of experts that reside typically in the division next to the expert. There is also something called regional expert team. So I, uh, after three years of uh, managing the global product support, I was asked to manage the Asia a regional team in, in, in our company, we call it Total Product Support, TPS, but in general, it's, it's a regional experts that are sitting in the regional, most of them sitting in the regional, some of them can sit in the, in the manufacturing. And whenever the, the service engineer that are in the site cannot solve the problem, the escalation goes to the regional. And if the regional cannot solve it, the escalation go to the GPS, as I told you before, the global product support, that they are the, the what we call a third level of escalation. So here, if before I manage a team for supporting the DRSM, here I, I manage a team that's supporting all our division product. It was a CDSM, DRSM, some optical wafer inspection, all the tools that we have at customer site in Asia, uh, we support. Uh, with the expert that uh, used to report for me. Uh, I did it for five years. And I'm, when I'm talking about Asia at that time, I'm talking about uh, China, Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, uh, Japan. So a lot of traveling uh, to customer sites, meeting customers in different cultures, uh, really, really something that I, uh, I enjoyed. Uh, I did it for five years. So after five years doing really good job and, and building a very strong team, I was asked by my uh, management to, to kind of duplicate the success of Asia and build a similar team in, in North America. Uh, at that point I moved, I, I cannot do it from Israel. The Asia, the Asia job I did from Israel uh, and with a lot of travels. But the North America, I had to go and, and live in, uh, in California. So also there built a similar team with experts to support the North America install base, making sure that the customer engineers sitting at customer sites uh, have the right uh, proficiency to support the tools. And of course, managing uh, customer escalation. Uh, later on, I, I uh, you know, it was something like 2011. I left the plight for about three years. I established my own company, doing some uh, consulting in in a service area. Uh, but at that time, uh, I also moved to the solar. I was in the solar industry for some time. Um, I didn't mention it here because it's not related to chips and stuff. But also another amazing uh, experience that uh, that I had. Going back to applied in 2013. Uh, to the same group called uh, Global Product uh, Support. I was there in the service business unit uh, and I was responsible to uh, a team of uh, PLMs that uh, basically making sure that uh, each and every NPI designed and developed by our, by our division will be ready to be support. It means that uh, something called the SRR, Service Readiness Report. We make sure that those experts that uh, PLMs that reports to me making sure that each and every product have uh, defined spare parts, uh, all the procedures exist, uh, the training is sufficient, and all these kind of things are uh, in, in good shape so we can ship uh, NPIs, new product introduction, uh, new products basically to, to our customers. That's one thing that I manage. The another team that I manage was a team of uh, PLMs that develop and what we call today digital tools. Digital tools we are servicing right now, we are servicing as, a, we are selling it as a service, and we are selling basically licensing. Those are just imaging uh, uh, computers that are doing uh, some data analysis on the huge amount of the data going out from the tools. Our tools generating a huge amount of data Sometimes the customers don't know what to do with. Customer needs more meaningful data. So to give the customer more meaningful data, 
uh, a lot of analysis that the customer can customize for him to understand whether his process is okay or he have an issue uh, in his process. This is very critical. So I, I did manage this, uh, this amazing team. And what I'm doing right now up to uh, these days, I'm now the service business uh, focal for Asia. Uh, in general, I'm uh, maximizing the service business of our division from Asia, making sure that uh, we are bringing uh, value to the customer. So customer is uh, uh, buying service contract year after year. For the, again, I, I just, uh, my understanding that you did go through the process, I just go for people that are not uh, familiar with the, with the process. So just to show you, uh, this is an, a silicon ingot that uh, later on is being sold by a wafer saw to a wafer, as you can see here uh, in the upper the picture, the, how the wafer is, looks, uh, silicon wafer. I wanted to show you here that there are different uh, wafers with the uh, first different size. When I started, there was also a four inch wafer, believe it or not, four inch wafer when I started. Today, we are talking about 12 inch. Uh, a lot of uh, dyes, sometimes, uh, not a lot, sometimes a lot. At the end of the day, those are the chips that are being uh, diced uh, from the wafer. And uh, if I'm talking about the process, the process of, a, a lot of uh, multiple intercept steps uh, from patterning to deposition, uh, planetarization, etching, cleaning and doping. Uh, this is a very uh, uh, long, sometimes can take a long time, uh, sometimes can take uh, short, it can take from up to about, uh, I don't know, one or two weeks to about three months, depends on the complexity. Uh, so those are the different steps uh, from wafer cleaning to oxidation. Then the photolithography with the scanners used to be steppers, uh, building the patterns, then etching, doping. And this is what, uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, creating the, the chips, the chip. Uh, again, some more, some more step. And the reason that I put all the step, just for you to understand that Almost each and every step that you see here, there is a system, there is a, a, a equipment manufacturer that build a system for this uh, specific, uh, specific step. Uh, those, steps are, those steps are very critical. Uh, we, uh, we, our division, the division that I belong to called PDC, Process Diagnostic and Control, we are uh, measuring and scanning the wafers for defects. Uh, almost after a very uh, each and every critical step. Uh, so that's something very, very interesting. And uh, the more the more advanced the, uh, the process, again, when I started, the process was 130 uh, nanometer uh, nanometers. And right now we are talking about three nanometers. Some people talk about two nanometers. I can tell you that production, I believe there is a either seven or five nanometers production already. And as long as the process is advanced, the more steps, the more critical is the inspection. And generally speaking, the more tools that the customer is, uh, is uh, buying from us, from uh, my company. Uh, talking about what is FAB equipment. So FAB equipment is in general is a specialized machinery that used in the semiconductor fabrication to fabricate or to manufacturing the, the chip. Uh, it is uh, crucial to produce semiconductor device. Uh, again, there are some uh, very uh, simple uh, fab equipment such as, uh, uh, let's call it a microscope or, or uh, something like that, which is uh, very not sophisticated or not that complex. And the, most of the tools that uh, I'm referring to are tools which we call multidisciplinary system, which have mechanics, electronic, uh, robotics, computing, vacuum, imaging. So in order to service this tool, you need to be, uh, to be knowledgeable on all of these fields. Uh, and that's something that uh, most of the critical uh, um, equipment in the fab contain of. 
the equipment must have technological advance and continuous innovation. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the process is always getting better. The process is always uh, uh, getting shrink. So your equipment have to be up to speed uh, and uh, continuous uh, improvement needs to apply to, to, to the systems. Uh, there is a very tie, uh, tight uh, relationship between the chip makers and the equipment makers in order to make sure that we understand their roadmap. So we develop a system to meet their, uh, their future. Uh, so this is in general, what is a fab equipment? Talking about uh, the top 10 semiconductor equipment companies, I'm talking again, not on the chip makers, I'm talking about the equipment uh, companies. So I can tell you that between the number one and two, and maybe the top five, there is every year it can be, it can be different, but in general, those are the top 10 companies that uh, uh, manufacturing the equipment to build the semiconductor chips. Uh, the fact that applied materials are number one, it's not because we are dominating the, the industry on each and every product, it's mostly because of the fact that we have a different, uh, I'd say a big, very big portfolio of products uh, from edge to uh, CVD, PVD, CMP, which is chemical uh, polishing and, and uh, the, the recent acquirement, uh, acquires of, uh, of, uh, of PDC, all the inspection and metrology product. So in terms of uh, revenue, uh, we are based in 2021, we're the number one in, in the market. One more thing that I want to share with, with, with you before I'm going into the, uh, into, the FAB, uh, into the service engineer and application engineer is just to show you how much uh, the chip makers are uh, spending, let's say spending on, on equipment. We are here in 2023, you can see roughly about $84 billion uh, of, of equipment. Uh, and by uh, 2030, it's, it's almost doubled. So in general, uh, I can tell you from my experience, almost every year, there are new fabs. When customer is building a new fab, uh, they need the new equipment. And it's a lot of money that they are spending. It's you're talking about billion of dollars that they are spending for each fab. And that's something that the, the equipment uh, market is, uh, is, begin, is, is getting bigger year after year. Uh, here I choose to show you two different tools just for you again to understand how the tools looks for people that never been to a fab to a clean room. So you can see on the, on the top right side, uh, both of them, by the way, are applied tools. Uh, this is a process tool. This is, a, a, you can see here the, in, in the orange, a cassette with wafers. There is a robot that basically take the wafers inside the different chambers. By the way, each chamber can do a different process. Uh, some wafers will go to all the chambers, some wafers will go to, uh, to only uh, some of the chambers, depend on the recipe that the service engineer or the application engineer will write uh, on the tools. Uh, here below that, it's, a, it's an inspection tool. So again, the, the same concept, there are this cassette with wafers and there is a robot that take the wafers from the cassette into the, into the system. Here inside, you can see, you can find a, a chamber. It's a, it's a vacuum chamber when there is a stage, very precise stage, uh, taking the wafer under the optical microscope, later on under the scanning electron microscope, have to be very precise, need to measure with the precision of one nanometer. Uh, so the complexity of the computing, the complexity of the, of the accuracy of the stage and the maintenance of these tools are, are really uh, at uh, the top of the edge. Uh, the size is very, but in general, uh, just imagine uh, three meters by uh, three meters and uh, the height is, uh, is about 2.5 meters, just, just to give you uh, some uh, 
uh, to fill the, the, the size of this very big uh, system. It's the size of a, of, a, of a room, at least in Israel, it's a room, uh, a living room, uh, a children's room actually. Uh, talking about the clear room, so again, I wanted to, to give you again uh, some uh, flavor how a clean room looks. Uh, so that's uh, different systems. Typically, the customer will set the, uh, the different system on uh, in a way that the, the wafer will flow from one system to another. You don't want to move the wafer too far from each other. So if the process starting here, the, typically the, the next will be closer. Uh, this is our engineers in the bunny suits. Uh, you see a lot of uh, uh, holes in the floor. Uh, that's because of the fact that we are talking about the clean room. Uh, clean room means mean that uh, uh, there, are not, there is no dust. There should be no dust at least. It depends on the cluster of the clean room. Uh, most of the most innovative uh, fabs, the class is class one, which is mean that there is uh, less than 10 particles at the size of uh, 100 to 200 nanometer particle. And this is being measured all the time. You can see also holes here. It means that the, there is an air that uh, flowing all the time here in order to make sure that this, env this environment is clean. You can see that the wafers are in the cassettes, are closed, again, in order to keep them uh, clean. As I mentioned before, talking about the process of uh, five nanometers, each and every particle, it's a killer. If there is a particle and you, you are continuing with your process, once you have a particle on the wafer, again, starting with the bay wafer and building all your, uh, your chip can be a disaster. Uh, one more thing that I want to tell you, the, the earliest you find it, you can do some kind of a rework. That's where our tools, the inspection tools, uh, uh, the optical wafer inspection and the defect review are critical and customers are using them more and more once the, the process uh, and the device is shrink. Uh, again, this is a service engineer just to show you that uh, you know we are in a bunny suits with gloves, uh, to do service uh, with this kind of uh, bunny suit and gloves is, uh, is a challenging sometimes, so you need to get used to it. Uh, you need to have most of the knowledge in your head. Uh, and uh, if not, uh, there is a, 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 a place that you can typically place either on the system or in the cloud that you can connect and get some more procedure and more help, of course. Uh, with the new uh, HoloLens and this kind of things, the, the servicing become uh, uh, more nicer so we can from remote can do some actions on the tool, either uh, to operate the tool or to do a troubleshooting. Uh, so that's, that's about the clean room, how it looks, how the system looks and uh, how challenging is our environment. Now we'll talk a little bit about what is customer engineer. So again, in general, there is a service engineer, an application engineer. I can tell you that, uh, and I'm talking about the service and, and support. Uh, of course, in the recent years, with the, the heavy computing that we have on the tools, sometimes some companies have all with the HPC, what we call HPC, high performance computing, uh, in order to really generate a huge amount of data, you need a very powerful computing and you need a storage uh, from NetApp and, 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 and Dell and, and Intel. Uh, so there is also somebody who called the software engineer that in recent years uh, added to, to the support team, but, uh, but this is not applicable to all the system. This is not applicable to all companies. So I didn't mention that. I just want you to, to be aware that there is uh, additional engineers that uh, uh, not, do not need to support it on a, on a daily basis, but this is another discipline that uh, start to develop uh, in the service team. The service engineer is a focus on uh, post-sale. So we are selling a system to the customer. Uh, this engineer will come to the customer, will get engaged with the customer at early time, talk with the customer about the installation, is the one that installing the tool. So first impression of the customer is from the installation period, from the service engineer. 
uh, he is doing the, uh, all the activity on the tool first throughout the installation, then when there is a need for uh, periodic maintenance, almost each and every, every uh, tools from the company that I showed you before, KLA, uh, uh, applied materials, SML, we do something called preventive maintenance. We want to do some, some uh, testing and uh, fixing the tool before it's break uh, as a surprise to the customer. Then that's what we call corrective maintenance. Customer like us to do things on, a, on a preventing maintenance and schedule maintenance rather than unscheduled maintenance because this disturbing their process, this disturbing their uh, timeline sometimes. So all of this is being done by the, by the service engineer. And again, service engineer needs to have a strong technical skills, uh, deep understanding of the operation and the maintenance of the system. Uh, of course, uh, troubleshooting because uh, customer really concerned about tool uptime. And if it takes you a long time to service the tool to fix the problem, the tool uptime will be uh, reduced. And this can affect the customer. And when we are selling, by the way, a service contract, we are committing to a certain uptime. Uh, so our interest is the engineers that will be servicing the tools will be in a good skills, uh, good knowledge, and, uh, you know, uh, involving electronics, mechanical, as I mentioned before, the multidisciplinary system required you as a service engineer to have a knowledge and all on, of these uh, disciplines. So this is a service engineer. Uh, just for your information, we typically each and every company will have different layers of expertise. There is the customer engineers that is reside on site, do the dailies with the customer, interact on a daily basis with the customer. If he cannot solve the problem, there is a regional uh, engineers that have a, a better knowledge, higher knowledge, more experience, more years of experience, so, and they face more challenging issues so they can help him to resolve the issue. And there is the, the, the second level of escalation, which are the global teams uh, that are, you know, if the first, the, the service engineer, the first escalation, the second agenda escalation cannot solve, they are solving almost 100% of the, of the issues. So this is service engineer, it's more of a hardware team, hardware of the tool. Uh, and then there is the application engineer. So application engineer, uh, of course, need to have a very good knowledge of the tools. The application engineer is basically optimizing the tools uh, for the customer. You know, each and every customer have a different process. Uh, we are selling tools for a variety of, of customers, variety of technology. So our tools can work on a, let's say a 28 or 40 nanometer process and can work on a seven nanometer process. And, and the optimizing of this uh, uh, of the tools for customers is being done by the application engineer. Uh, as I mentioned before, when we are installing the tool, we typically do the hardware installation, then an application engineer is coming to do the testing of the tool, making sure the tool is meeting the spec. This is typically a, a application engineer work. A application engineer work is working very closely with the customer and know the process of the customer, helping customers sometimes to solve issues on his process because of his experience. Um, this engineer is, uh, is, again, as I mentioned before, need to have a very good knowledge of the process. It doesn't have to be a, a electronic engineer or mechanic engineer as, as it's important for the service engineer. It can be somebody with a background of uh, chemics, uh, or, or uh, materials, uh, you can see this kind of, uh, of a good application engineer uh, at customer sites. Uh, continuing a service engineer interact with customers pre preliminary when there is a technical issues. Uh, typically he will talk to the tool owners, uh, the tool owners and the service engineer will have a very good relations uh, the service engineer will do the diagnostic and resolving the problem. Uh, 
Sometimes, uh, you know, it depends on the customer. Sometimes you have to be uh, on a daily basis uh, at customer site. Some customers, the, when the tool is, uh, is up and running, they don't need you to be there. Uh, they know how to do some basic, uh, basic uh, uh, fix of issues. So they're calling you only when there is, a, there is an issue. Uh, the, process, the, the application engineer, uh, his counterperson is the process engineer. If before I said the tool owner, the one that's responsible for the hardware, so the application engineer have a very good, good relation with the customer process engineers, sometimes the yield engineer, they work together uh, in solving issues related to recipes or solving issues related to the process uh, working together. So in summary, while both application engineer and service engineers are uh, integral to the semiconductor industry. They have distinct roles and responsibilities. As I mentioned before, the application engineer preliminary focus on the pre-sales and process support. When I said pre-sales, application engineer is the one that will do some demos to customer when we are demonstrating the, uh, the tools capabilities on customer wafers. So this will be the application engineer while the service engineer is concentrated on the post sales once the tool is in a customer site and doing the maintenance. I can tell you that, you know, as a service team, the, the most rewarding thing is that the customer is buying the second tool. Typically, we used to say that the first tool is being sold by the sales team, but the second and third and fourth team Four tools are being sold by the service engineer. If the service team are good, I'm talking about service engineer and application engineer, customer feel comfortable, so the customer will continue to buy, to buy those tools uh, from, uh, from our company. Just to, to summarize, so the key takeaways, the semiconductor industry continue its steady growth year after year, and so the semiconductor equipment manufacturers as I showed you before, from 80, million, 80 billion to uh, more than 140. The complexity of the semiconductor machines require high proficiency from the service engineers and the application engineers. And the service engineer plays a significant role in semiconductor equipment companies growth. As I mentioned before, a good service team, more, more customer feel comfortable, more tools he will buy from, uh, from our company. So this is basically what I had to say, Baljit and, and the team. Uh, thank you so much, Rami. We had several Q&A questions that have come in. Uh, sure. Let's, let's uh, go into the Q&A session. Just give mm -hmm. me one second. <clears throat> so uh, Rami, uh, what I would like to kind of start off is, you know, just, I, I loved your uh, phrase of differentiating between application and service engineer. Uh, so customer service engineer in one line uh, is the person who's responsible for the installation. And we can define application engineer as a person who optimizes the tool for a given process. Is that uh, a good summary uh, to differentiate between customer service and application engineer? Yeah, yeah, I think I mentioned it, maybe I, I was talking a, a lot about, uh, about this, but bottom line, yes, I agree. The application engineer is in general is optimizing the tool to the customer process because we are selling it to different processes and we need to optimize it per, per customer. And that's why the application engineer will do the optimization while the hardware engineer, the service engineer will make sure the tool is up and running. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question uh, on the defect rate. Uh, so what is a typical defect rate in chip manufacturing? Uh, what's, uh, so I think, you know, uh, uh, a defect rate can be differentiated in two parts. Uh, one is at the given process step, 
uh, what is the defect rate and the other uh, people always confuse defect rate to the yield uh, yield yeah. of a wafer so maybe you can talk a little bit about both yeah so again it depends uh, on the customer process and if the customer is still in the r d versus the production you know customers that in the pilot testing the his process there are much more defects rather when the, the customer is in the production you see much less defects because we our customer try to catch most of the of the defects while doing the pilot and in the production you would like to do a high volume manufacturing and, and the production should run in terms of numbers you know uh, some customer have uh, 10, 10 defects per, per wafer, some customer can have hundreds and thousands. Uh, I can tell you that on our system, we have something called ADC, automatic defect classification, where we are classifying the defects into a bins. Uh, and in general, customers sometimes more care about killer defects. And killer defects, you see much less, even nothing, uh, going through the, the cycle of the, of the process development. Well, I mean, next question is, uh, what's a typical qualification uh, of a service engineer uh, when you're hiring? Typically, it has to be a, a, an engineer, uh, have to, to have a bachelor degree in engineering. Uh, the preferred is uh, electronics or mechanics. Uh, this is the typical uh, service engineers that uh, are, you know, in general, being successful later on. Could you kind of share uh, some insights on day-to-day -day responsibility of a customer service engineer? What exactly they go through? Yeah, so again, it's it's uh, it's very between different customers. I can tell you that uh, in these days, uh, most of the top customers that we discussed before will have something like a, a server that will collect a lot of parameters with the tools and you will have some kind of a traffic light saying that the tool is up or there are some issues. Uh, so service, service engineer will go to the fab and fix those tools that are uh, uh, classified as red and have some issues. Uh, so that's the, that's the main uh, task of, of a service engineer. On top of it, the customer's engineer need to do a PM. So there is a, a, a monthly PM, there is a quarterly PM, there is a yearly PM which is an activity that you do in order to prevent uh, tools to be uh, unscheduled downtime. So engineer will go to the, to the fab, uh, will spend some time on the tool, do some, uh, some checks or some fixes, then go out uh, and you know, uh, we can see from our computers, the tool status, uh, if there is an issue, we can go again to the fab and, and fix the issues. Mm -hmm. uh uh, Rami, what are the, some of the key challenges or rewards of being a customer service engineer? What's the biggest challenge you face in your day-to-day -day activities? The challenge is the customer escalation. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, when there is a customer escalation, it means that, uh, you know, uh, the tool is down and uh, the service engineer, the local service engineer cannot uh, fix the issue. Uh, that's something that uh, you know the, the the atmosphere is uh, is not the best. Although when you with years you are tying such such a relationship with the customer that uh, you you can manage it. Uh, so that's that's a not a nice experience. On the other hand, uh, challenging can be a first time issue. You know when you you say you you find an issue that uh, never happened before. And this is typically with the NPI, the new products that are being uh, sold to customers. Mm -hmm. uh, that's challenge, but the rewarding is, you know, and I, I'm, I'm having it time after time when I'm fixing a tool, the, the feeling that you have, the, the rewards that you have inside you, wow, I fixed the tool. It's something that, uh, you know, somebody that never do this cannot imagine. There is an issue, there is an escalation. You come, you do some troubleshooting, you, uh, sometimes you replace something or something you do a calibration and the tool is up and running. The, you see the customer, the, the customer face and, and did something and the tool is running. For me, that's the, the, the most rewarding. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, no, I totally agree. Uh, but the other perk uh, of being a customer service engineer or an application engineer is uh, you get to travel a lot. So I presume you must have been to all the different, uh, how many countries have you traveled? Uh, wow. Well, I travel to all North America customers, uh, Japan, all key customers in Japan from uh, Toshiba Kiyoshia to Sony, Sanyo, uh, uh, Sharp, all the customers in Japan, in China, in TSMC, Taiwan, uh, South Korea, in Samsung, in Hynix, uh, uh, Global Foundries. I mean, I've been to all the customers. I met all the customers. Uh, it's really interesting, the, the different cultures, uh, the, the different uh, uh, service approach in each and every customer. Uh, the other question, Rami, we have come uh, got is, uh, do you see uh, AR, VR capabilities in troubleshooting uh, being utilized right now? How do you yes. use those now? Yes, absolutely. Uh, at least in my company, and I'm sure that it's not uh, unique to my company. Uh, we do, we start to do a lot of uh, troubleshooting via HoloLens. Uh, I can tell you that uh, not all the customer uh, allow it, uh, but we are developing it in a way that it will be secured in secure rooms. Uh, and I see more and more customers that allowing uh, HoloLens, which is a VR and a remote tool access that you can remotely access the tool, do some troubleshooting, uh, so this is getting more and more uh, developed and customers are more and more open to it. Do you also see the use of uh, blockchain technology? Uh, and if so, if it's already deployed, how is it deployed? Blockchain, you mean in, in semiconductors? Yeah. I'm not exposed to it, no. Yeah. So I, I, I again, with my... Uh, there is less of blockchain uh, we see in semiconductor right now, uh, but there's a lot of focus on definitely AR, VR. I totally agree on it. Yeah. Uh, we, we have Rami a question on uh, semiconductor emissions, uh, global emissions. Yeah. Uh, if you want to touch a little bit about that. Uh, yeah, so this is definitely some uh, initi new initiative that all of the semiconductors are, are into it. Uh, we have a zero emission by 2030. Don't catch me on that. I think it's by 2030. It means that our tools will be uh, less, uh, uh, less uh, power consumption. Uh, all the modules will be in a way that uh, the, at the end of the day, it will uh, emit a zero, a zero emission. Uh, so there is a zero emission uh, initiative also in applied materials, and I'm sure that in all all the big customers that we are looking into it and will design the tools to be more uh, friendly with the environment. Yeah, uh, at Ajuba, we will be hosting a, uh, a focused uh, webinar on uh, how semiconductor companies are tackling with global emissions uh, in the month of November. So uh, stay tuned, uh, whoever has posted this question uh, for that. Final question, Rami, since we're approaching our uh, uh, mark of close, uh, can you kind of give us one thing that you like the most of uh, your job of being a customer service uh, leader? Well, I told you about uh, you know, the feeling after fixing a tool. And the other thing is that, uh, which is really rewarding, uh, you know, uh, it, it's really something that time after time you feel you see the customer smiling, you see the tool up and running, and that's something that uh, is really uh, amazing. The other thing is that, you know, that uh, you're servicing a customer with uh, tackling all the issues, tackling all the, all the obstacles, and then the customer is buying the second tool. So when customer is buying the second tool, and then typically it will be uh, after rewarding the, the service team, that's another uh, really uh, a nice feeling that you have as a service engineer. Uh, as I mentioned before, there is a, a saying in our industry that the first tool is being sold by the sales and then it by uh, the rest of the tools are being sold by the service. And this is really true. If you have a good service team, the customer like it, the customer will buy the second tool from you. 
Otherwise, uh, you know, the customer will go to a second value to the competition. So this is really a rewarding. Amazing, uh, Rami. Uh, really yeah. want to thank you uh, for your time, uh, giving us an in-depth uh, journey of uh, a customer service uh, role in semiconductor. Uh, thank you again. I, I kind of go back to my our days uh, at Applied Materials where uh, I was an application engineer and you were focusing on customer service. Right. <laughs> uh, now that tool has really taken uh, the industry by storm uh, when the tool came out uh, in 1997. Uh, yeah. yeah, so congratulations awesome. to all of the Opal team, original team. And yeah. I feel proud that we were part of that journey. Thanks a lot, Baljit. Thanks for hosting me. Thank you. Thank you, Rami. Thank you, everybody. And stay tuned for our next webinar next month uh, on semiconductors and cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing. Let's keep learning uh, and let's uh, grow in our journey of life. Thank you again. Thanks, Rami. Thank you all. Thanks, Baljit. Bye.